Hello everyone. So, uh, in the previous lecture, we have discussed about the development of occlusion part 1, which included uh, the development of occlusion in pre-dented and the primary dentition. So, in this we will be dis uh, discussing about the mixed dentition and the permanent dentition and along with that the self-correcting anomalies. So, moving on to the learning objectives, in uh, the learning objectives is the chronology, eruption of primary teeth, permanent uh, dentition, teething, development of occlusion, factors that influence the development of occlusion and transient malocclusions. So, uh, this we have already discussed in the previous lecture that is the stages of development of occlusion. First is the pre-dentate and the primary dentition. So, what are the changes that we see along with the ages? Uh, so, in the pre-dentate stage, we see uh, changes from birth to the time of eruption of the first primary teeth that is birth to six months. Uh, in the pr uh, primary dentition, you have teeth that is the pr once the primary tooth erupts till the last uh, primary tooth that erupts or before the eruption of the first prime uh, permanent molar. So now we'll discuss about the mixed dentition period. So the mixed dentition period starts at around six years of age and lasts till twelve years of age. Six years because that is the first uh, that is the time when the first permanent molar erupts into the oral cavity along with the primary dentition and uh, twelve years uh, till the time the primary teeth is also there in the oral cavity along with the permanent dentition. So in this phase. Uh, or the period that is a mixed dentition period, we have uh, the, uh, classes which is divided into uh, three different phases. So, you have the first transition period, intertransition period and the second transitional period. So, in the first uh, transitional period, we have uh, the changes that we see are first is the emergence of the permanent first molar. So, as you can see here in this picture, uh, the blue color is the primary teeth and the yellow color which is still not erupted into the oral cavity is the uh, permanent tooth. So, here the tooth that first uh, uh, that is first seen in the uh, first transitional period is the emergence of the first permanent molars into the oral cavity that is the maxillary and the mandibular both. Then if we have the early mesial shift. This again we will be discussing further. Uh, the early mesial shift is noticed. The third that thing we notice is the correction of the incisal liability is also corrected. And the fourth is the correction of anterior deep bite. Correction of the anterior deep bite and by the age of 8 years the uh, permanent molar is already as you can see here also by 7 years the permanent molars have come into occlusion. So what is early mesial shift? So this is uh, the early mesial shift is seen in space dentition as you can see in this picture here again in this uh, picture that is it occurs in the space dentition where there is generalized spaces that are seen in the tooth. Uh, that may be physiological spaces or the primate spaces and this occurs because of the utilization uh, this shift occurs because of the utilization of the primate space for mesial shift of the erupting permanent molar. So what happens in the early mesial shift when the permanent tooth uh, seen in uh, a space dentition so when the permanent tooth erupts so this is the permanent tooth when the permanent tooth erupts, it does not only erupt uh, occlusally, but also it has some amount of shift or ap application of pressure towards the mesial side. So, as you can see, this mandibular molar is erupting up, upward and mesially. So, this mesial push of force from the permanent molar will move the um, primary molars and close the space which was previously available. So, what are the spaces? So, these spaces are the spaces like the physiological or the primate spaces. But the early mesial shift does not occur if 
there are uh, the patient has a non space dentition so if you do there is no physiological or uh, primate spaces in the primary dentition so what will happen there is no mesial shifting of the permanent uh, molar so these early mesial shift will help in determining the type of occlusion in the permanent dentition so if the primary dentition has a distal relationship this is related to the mandibular uh, and the maxillary uh, second primary molar so this is the second primary molar and uh, if the mesial shift is uh, if there is minimal growth of the uh, jaws then this class 2 is seen in the permanent dentition if it is forward growth of the mandible that occurs then it is end to end or if there there is a shift of teeth which we see in the mesial step that again will cause end to end relationship same will occur with the flush terminal of the primary second molars so what do we see if there is minimal growth differentiation of the jaws minimal growth differentiation means if the there is minimum amount of growth of the jaws or uh, movement of the teeth then you see a flush uh, end to end relationship and the flush terminal uh, will show a slight shift of teeth then it will cause class 1 relationship in the permanent dentition or if it is forward growth of the mandible that has occurred then it will show class 1 molar relationship now again the same thing for the mesial step which is seen in the uh, primary second molars that if there's minimal growth differentiation you see class 1 or if there's forward growth of the mandible uh, class 3 or shift of teeth also causes class 3 occlusion in the permanent dentition so as we have spoken about the incisal liability so incisal liability as you can see this picture is the total sum that is the total of the meso distal width so each teeth has a mesial and the distal side so you have to me measure the meso distal width of all the four permanent incisors and the primary incisors and the difference that you see is called as the incisal liability so according to the definition that is the total sum of the meso distal width of the permanent four incisors is larger than that of the primary incisors so as you know the primary teeth are smaller so the permanent teeth are larger so that is the incisible incisal liability the total sum of the meso distal width of the of the four permanent incisors is larger than that of the primary incisors so this you see is a primary dentition and here is the permanent dentition so how is the incisal liability correction done so uh, you do see here what you see is the picture the tooth and the spaces these spaces are the physiological spaces and the primate spaces so how in a space dentition does this correction takes place or um, a space in a primary tooth gets corrected once the permanent tooth erupts so how is this corrected this is because of the uh, the space that is a physiological space i told you the physiological space and the primate space that exist in the primary teeth uh because uh, they are able to accommodate the small jaw that is the primary uh, the jaw is able to accommodate the permanent tooth because of the growth of the jaws and increase in the intercanine width so from canine of the maxillary of one quadrant to the canine of the maxillary of the second other quadrant be it maxillary or mandibular there is an increase in the intercanine width so this intercanine width also is the reason which is able to accommodate the large permanent incisors compared to the small primary incisors so this is called as the incisal liability and this is how it is corrected so as i told you in that is in intercanine with increases so the intercanine is here this is your canine 
so there's increase in the arch length and increase in the arch width so the intercanine width and intercanine arch length as i have told you arch width is if you make a horizontal uh, a line joining one canine to the other canine that is the width and our uh, intercanine arch length is the measurement from each incisal edge so this is the length so the increase in the intercanine and intercanine arch length and width uh, at the time of eruption of the maxillary and the mandibular incisors so the same it not only happens in the maxillary teeth but along with the maxillary it does occur in the mandibular teeth also so the intercanine here will be you take from the canine intercanine width is from one canine to the other canine you measure so this because of the increase in the intercanine width uh, the jaw is able to accommodate the large permanent tooth and along with that the intercanine arch length so the increase in the length of the dental arch in the anterior posterior dimension will provide space for the permanent incisors to be accommodated so uh, this increase in arch length which is not only and uh, and it is also anteriorly and posteriorly so this will cause or provide space as i have told you provide space for the permanent large permanent tooth to be accommodated so the incisor liability is also corrected uh, after the change of the axial inclination of the incisors so in the primary dentition as you know it is either edge to edge or they are um, in straight line to that of the uh, compared to that of the permanent dentition so the angulation of the primary teeth is around 150 degrees while that of the permanent tooth as you can see here the permanent tooth is angulated while the primary tooth is almost upright so the interincisal angle so the angle which we are talking about the interincisal is if you draw a straight line on both the teeth that is maxillary teeth and the mandibular incisor teeth the angle that is formed here this angle is the interincisal angle so the interincisal angle for a primary teeth is 150 degree and for a permanent tooth it is 123 degree so if for the primary teeth what would have actually happened this and anterior teeth which is slightly angulated it will be a little more upright then here it will be more upright so this increases the angulation so this again um, decrease in the angulation in the uh, the interincisal angle in the permanent dentition this increases the arch dental arch circumference in the permanent tooth so now we have a question so uh, from the picture that we see can you tell me if this will this condition self correct or not so uh, in this picture what we see is the child will be approximately 7 to 8 years of age because his permanent tooth this is the permanent tooth which is already erupted and the teeth which is here is the primary tooth so if i have to diagnose this patient it is a retained deciduous teeth along with lingually erupting permanent tooth so what is how do you correct this so this is actually uh, a self correcting but then we need to extract this uh, anterior uh, teeth that is the 7 one uh, and the 8 one so 7 one here and the 8 one and the tooth that is a permanent tooth will move to its place in the forward area how will it move this movement will occur because of the uh, the movement uh, from the tongue because the tongue tongue will push the tooth forward and this will help in uh, the tooth that is a permanent tooth coming into position okay. 
now we have the anterior deep bite so anterior deep bite which is corrected by eruption of the permanent molars so once the permanent um, molars erupts into the oral cavity and comes into occlusion the deep bite gets corrected uh, gets corrected so there is an increase in the vertical height of the alveolar bone process with the eruption of the permanent teeth so once the permanent teeth erupts the there's growth or uh, and the increase in the alveolar bone height which increases because of which once the alveolar bone height increases there is reduction in the deep bite so the deep bite anterior deep bite reduces because of the increased vertical dimension and there is also downward and forward growth of the mandible that occurs so the mandible not only grow, grows forward but it grows down and then forward because of which the anterior deep bite is corrected now the changes in the intra transitional period so what are the changes that we see in the intra transitional period so this is the second stage of the mixed dentition so what are the changes that we see there is occlusion attrition of the primary molars and canines so in this intra transition period we don't see much changes there is only slight amount of attrition of the primary molars and the canines it's not only occlusally but along with it proximally also so there is some amount of tooth movement that occurs during uh, this intertransitional period so in the intertransitional period we have two sets of teeth as uh, this is a mixed dentition so two sets of teeth that we see is the permanent incisors and the uh, permanent incisors that has erupted you have the permanent molars that have erupted and uh, you have the deciduous canines and the first and the second uh, primary molars <coughs> so in this uh, intertransitional period is uh, which is seen between 9 years of age you will see ugly duckling stage or the broad bend phenomenon so the ugly duckling stage persist in the upper incisors and under the influence of the tongue the mandibular incisors attain a more proper sight from its lingual position so as i have shown you in the previous case um, uh, picture in which i had asked you about what if, if it is a self correcting anomaly or it can be corrected by itself so this tells us that the, because of the tongue the pressure from the tongue will help the mandibular incisors to move into its proper lingual position a proper position from where it was lingually erupting uh, when the primary teeth were present and uh, this phase is a more stable phase but uh, there is hardly much changes which are seen so the sec uh, the third uh, stage period in the Uh, mixed dentition phase is the second transitional period so now we have the late mesial shift so in this we have the late mesial shift uh, there is emergence of the lateral teeth so the lateral teeth are the canines and the premolars the teeth which are present laterally and there is eruption of the second permanent molars there is establishment of occlusion and broadment phenomenon so late mesial shift occurs in a non space dentition early mesial shift occurs in a space dentition so the late mesial shift uh, in uh, occurs in the non spaced primary dentition and in this what happens because there was no space in the primary dentition so uh, how is the teeth going to move forward this is because of the utilization of the leeway space of nans so what is the leeway space of nans that is the distance or the um, if you measure the c which is the canine first molar second molar is more than 3 which is the canine the permanent first molar uh, the pe permanent canine permanent uh, the premolar first and the second premolars so this utilization the tooth moves forward because of the utilization of the leeway space of nans 
and uh, this occurs once the uh, after the eruption of the permanent first molar so what is the leeway space of nans that we see in the maxillary arch it is 0.9 mm on each side so in this picture uh, this is a primary dentition this is the permanent tooth that is canine first premolar second premolar so if we see the uh, measurement the length the primary teeth are larger compared to the permanent teeth so whatever gap you see here this is utilized by the uh, permanent tooth when they are erupting so in the maxillary arch it is said to be 1.8 mm uh, while it is 0.9 mm in each side and in the mandibular arch it, the leeway space of nans is larger larger how because your ma mandibular teeth are wider the occlusal table is wide because of which the mandibular arch uh, is 3.4 mm and it is 1.7 mm on each side so why it is more on the mandibular arch as i have already told you the mandibular teeth are larger compared to the uh, maxillary teeth the mesio distal dimension of the second mandibular second molar primary molar is larger because of which the uh, the uh, space or the arch length is larger and because of which the difference between the maxillary and the mandibular it is different because of which we have a uh, the leeway uh, space of nans is more in the uh, mandibular arch compared to the maxillary arch this again will signify or tell you what type of primary uh, occlusion uh, or uh, when you have a primary tooth with occlusion and what it changes to in the permanent dentition so how do you manage the leeway space of nans so in this case if you see what has actually happened uh, this is the canine the primary canine which is here the primary uh, first um, molar and the second molar is been extracted because of any reason because of a caries grossly decayed or anything so how do you manage this space and keep it keep the space so that the permanent uh, you provide space for the permanent tooth to erupt into the oral cavity because once the permanent molar erupts it not only comes up but it also moves mesial if so this will if the uh, if we do not provide any space maintainer so what will happen this will close the gap and there will be some amount of crowding as you can see here uh, they have not maintained the leeway space because of which there is crowding and there is no space for the premolar to erupt and hence at the end what do you see crowding of the permanent dentition so as we have discussed about the uh, told you about the broadband phenomenon so what is broadband phenomenon actually broadband phenomenon or ugly duckling stage is the same thing so in this picture as you can see at the age of 7 years the tooth will be uh, seen flared so there will be literally like a v shape so both the incisal edges will be away from each other so there will be gap if you see in a 7 8 9 years old there will be a huge gap between the two central incisors because you can see this v shape they are at the age of 9 years the gap will uh, comparatively reduce because once the canines are erupting in this picture what is happening the canines are erupting they are applying pressure on the lateral incisor that lateral incisor is applying pressure on the central incisor canine uh, the central incisor root and because the lateral is applying pressure on the central root so the crown is flaring it in the opposite direction in a 9 years old what is happening the uh, canine has come down from the root area to the middle third of the lateral incisor so the now the application of pressure is in the middle third of the root so because of which 
uh, there is some amount of closure of the space so once the canine comes down and erupts so it will apply pressure not in the root but in the crown area so this will help in the closure of the roots at the crown portion so the centrals will move close to each other and hence close the space see in this radio in the opg the canines i have not erupted they are close to the root of the lateral incisor because of which there is application of pressure and the tooth uh, the crown part moves distally same thing on the other side because the crown the uh, canine is in the root area it's applying pressure and so the crown is moving distally away from the center but once a canine moves or uh, erupts the space closure occurs so now once the see once the canine has erupted into the oral cavity what has happened there is space closure that has occurred okay so now we have a question again is this condition self correcting prominent teeth has erupted these are the 1 1 and again the prominent teeth are here so what do you think is this space which is seen here is self correcting or not self correcting so this uh, condition what we see is again self correcting how self correcting what we have learned is about the broad bend phenomena that is occurring here again so uh, at this stage what do you think the uh, canine or where do you think the canine is so the canine in this stage is close to the root of the lateral incisor because the uh, it is pushing the root of the lateral incisor and the lateral incisor root is pushing the lat the central incisor so this is causing what the central incisors and the lateral incisor crown is moving away from the center so which is creating the v shape so the central incisor is this central incisor is moving distally the other central incisor also moving distally crowns the roots are moving mesially but it gets corrected once the canines erupt into the oral cavity so it's like a uh, uh, we'll just discuss what we have read so in the mixed dentition what do we see it is from 6 years to 12 years of uh, years of age first transition period is in which you see the uh, first permanent molars along with the incisors which is seen in 6 to 8 years of age inter transition inter transition period there is hardly any changes which are seen while in the second transition there is exchange of the primary molars and canines so there is exchange from the primary to the permanent molars and exchange of the canines also that occurs so now we move on to the permanent dentition so in the permanent dentition what do we see we see there is a decrease in the arch length and decrease in overbed overbite and overjet so uh, the stages of development of occlusion is uh, in the permanent dentition is establishment of occlusion so uh, the arch length decreases because of the movement mesial movement of the uh, permanent tooth and this causes the uh, reduced arch length how do you monitor a developing occlusion as uh, according to aapd that is american academy of pediatric dentistry has said that uh, there is uh, should be assessment of developing uh, occlusion starts at 2 years of age so why 2 years of age because that is a time when you have all the whole set of primary dentition is there so you should start assessing the primary uh, dentition or the developing occlusion from that stage so because any problem in that stage can or should be corrected to prevent further uh, increase in the uh, uh, malocclusion and um, the monitoring as described by the aapd is it should be done at 6 years of age 10 years of age and 10 to 12 years of age 
6 years of age is early mesial shift. So, as you know, uh, 6 years of age, the permanent first molar uh, erupts, and this is a time when there is early mesial shift and uh, monitoring again should be done in this phase, especially in a patient who has a non-space dentition. Uh, monitoring at the age of 8 years should be done to check for the incisal liability. So, this is a time when uh, there is exchange of the incisors and uh, and even uh, there is change in the shift uh, the angulation of the anterior teeth, uh, change in the bites, change in the occlusion. So, again the monitoring is done at 8 years of age. Next the monitoring should be done at 10 to 12 years of age which is the late measles shift. So, during this phase you check for the broadband phen phenomenon you check that after the eruption of the lateral incisor is the space closure which is the central mid line diastema has closed or not. That again will uh, we need to uh, monitor in the developing occlusion. So, moving on to the self correcting anomaly. So, we will be learning about self correcting anomalies in each stage that is the pre dented, uh, the primary mixed and the permanent dentition. So, in the pre dentate the first thing that we see is the retrognathic mandible as I had told the maxilla is um, the previous lecture I had told the maxilla is uh, protruded while the mandible is small this helps in suckling. So, what we see is the retrognathic mandible a small mandible. So, this retrognathic mandible is corrected after the uh, because of the forward growth of the mandible. So, the mandible which was small now grows uh, forward and it becomes a normal uh, uh, jaw that is with the maxillary and the mandibular. The retrognathic mandible uh, gets corrected because of the forward growth of the mandible. Anterior open bite as you would have uh, uh, seen because of the retrognathic mandible there is anterior open bite which helps in suckling in children. Uh, this gets corrected by after the eruption of the primary incisors and you have the infantile swallowing pattern. The infantile swallowing pattern is the one in which uh, the child swallows putting the tip of the tongue uh, on the palate and uh, swallowing. So, that again that infantile swallowing pattern changes because of the use of a solid food. So, once a solid for food is introduced to the child, the pattern of drinking how they swallow the milk is changed from a liquid uh, pat, uh, pattern of swallowing to a solid once the child is introduced to solid food. So, next we have is the primary dentition. So, in the primary dentition we have the anterior deep bite. So, the anterior deep bite which we see in the primary teeth gets corrected after the eruption of the molars which is the permanent molars and also what happens the mandible which uh, grows down and forward uh, growth of the mandible that occurs. So, the spacing what we see in the primary dentition which is seen in the space dentition gets corrected after the molars erupt. So, once the molars erupt they move not only upward, but also uh, in the forward in the mesial direction. So, that again will close the space which were pre previously present in the primary tooth. Next we have the occlusion that is the flush terminal plane uh, in the primary dentition will uh, be corrected in uh, after the eruption of the first permanent molar and the leeway space. And the edge to edge uh, relationship of the anterior teeth will again corrected be corrected after the eruption of the permanent incisors. So, the, in the mixed dentition what we see there are four things four uh, uh, corrections that needs to be done that is anterior deep bite again uh, which we see in it gets corrected after the eruption of the permanent first molar. So, in the mixed dentition phase the permanent uh, first molar will completely come into occlusion and this 
will cause the increase in the vertical dimension of the jaws and hence reduce the anterior deep bite. Next we see anterior mandibular anterior crowding. So, the mandibular anterior crowding will be corrected because of the tongue pressure and increase in the intercanine width. As we know the uh, permanent tooth erupts uh, lingually, lingual to the uh, to the uh, primary tooth in the anterior region. So, uh, how is this anterior crowding corrected? Because once the uh, primary tooth exfoliates, the permanent tooth is pushed into position by the tongue, and this this pressure from the tongue puts the permanent tooth into its correct position and increases the reduces the uh, anterior crowding and it also increase the intercanine width. The end on relationship that is uh, the late mesial shift is seen in non space dentition. So, if there is an end on relationship, but this end on is corrected when and uh, in the late mesial shift and the late mesial shift is seen in a non space dentition. So, in the permanent dentition we have overjet and overbite which decreases with eruption of all the permanent molars. So, the overjet overbite which ever was more now um, gets corrected after the eruption of all the permanent molars. So, now we have the Andrews 6 key to occlusion which is the molar relation, we have mesodistal this all you will be uh, dealing or discussing more uh, in details later. So, uh, Andrew's 6 key to occlusion is molar relation, mesial distal crown angulation, the labiolingual crown angulation, the absence of rotation, tight contacts, curve of spi, correct tooth and tooth size Bolton's ratio. So, what are the factors that influence the development of normal occlusion? So, the factors that influence the development of normal occlusion is your general factors and the skeletal other uh, the local factors. Under the general factors, you have your skeleton factors, the muscle factors, and the dental factors. And under the local factors, we have any aberrant developmental position, supernumerary teeth, hypodontia, habits, or localized soft tissue anomalies. So, our normal occlusion uh, is dependent upon the skeletal factors that is the growth of the bone, growth of the jaws. Muscle factor is the, uh, the muscle forces from the tongue, forces from the buccal mucosa. This again plays an important role in the development of a normal occlusion. Then you have the dental factor. So, the dental factor is any malocclusion will again cause a, be a causative factor for uh, the uh, malocclusion, any uh, uh, crowding will be cause of the malocclusion. The local factors in that we have the apparent, apparent uh, developmental position. If there is any, any developmental problem uh, in or uh, uh, the tooth has not erupted into its correct place that again will cause some amount of uh, malocclusion. Supernumerary teeth, Super, supernumerary teeth will cause malocclusion because the space which should be occupied by the normal teeth is now occupied by an extra tooth that again will cause some amount of malocclusion. Hypodontia, reduced number of teeth will cause malocclusion. Habits again will cause malocclusion because the abnormal habits will uh, increase uh, the muscular forces and that will cause uh, that in turn will have an effect on the tooth. And lo localized soft tissue anomalies, any soft tissue growth uh, uh, will uh, cause the malocclusion to occur. So, now we have done our uh, development of occlusion part 1 and 2. Thank you.